I had a meeting the morning of 9-11 at New Jersey State Police's Marine Barracks. All of a sudden, we're like, wow, there's smoke coming out of that tower. And right. there's a lot of these folks that are saying like, ah, it never happened. It's yeah. a fraud. It's a government setup. Let me tell you, I heard and saw this thing. And it brought me back into my days in the Army. Yeah. The sounds and smells and everything that went with this. And we said, we're at war, man. This is war. So we make our way up to the towers, rescued a few people. I survived the collapse in the basement of the Burger King. Wow. and thought I was dead. You have to get results. Mm -hmm. There's so many people that can't get results. So what winds up happening is because of our reputation, we pick that up and the individual, the high net worth person, we provide them with a place where they fit in. And right. it is a powerful experience. Since that day in November of 2022, my life has been different. It's been better beyond anything I've ever had. My life was in turmoil. Mm. There was questions and things that happened. I isolated myself for an extended period of time, but God was there. He was always there. At 60, I feel like I still have, I have a 12 year plan. Resiliency is a powerful tool to be able to say, yeah, let's go. Yeah, I got beat up, I got knocked down, so what? Let's move it forward. Let's just get where we need to be as quickly as we can so we can help others. All right, Jim DiOrio. Man, Kevin, so glad to be here. We've been trying this for a minute. So I'm glad it just worked out. Yeah, thanks for coming down. You were in L.A. and you you hopped over to San Diego, so I really appreciate that. And shout out to uh, Julian Dory, who uh, we kind of got connected through, and you've been on a bunch of podcasts with him and yeah. with uh, Danny Jones and all those guys. So Absolutely. Man. Great guys, massive podcasts, and you do numbers too. I do do numbers. I don't know. I, they're looking for the uh, the bald sixty year old. So here I am. <laughs> you you definitely look the profile. Like there, I feel like anywhere you go, nobody looks at you and doesn't think that's a cop. <laughs> <laughs> like how did you do undercover stuff in the FBI? Oh, if I show you pictures, you'll know how. Really? Yeah, okay. I'll show you. I'll show you after the. Oh, show. you had hair then, right? No hair, no, no man. Hair. Always this look, but it yeah. was just a different. We mixed it up a little bit. Yeah. So. Well, I you could pass for a biker too, right? So absolutely, yeah. yeah. And that was the big thing. You know, if I if I get up about 30, 40 pounds from here, it's it's biker time. Really? Yeah. 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 So, so I want to jump straight to it. So you, I mean, you were an Army Ranger, West Point grad. Uh, FBI agent, special agent in charge. You have a just a phenomenal reputation, a phenomenal resume. And now you. you are uh, partnered with Andy Bustamante with uh, Everyday Spy. And you guys do a lot of training sessions and corporate stuff. But tell everybody a little bit about your time in the FBI. Yeah, man. So it, it's an interesting <clears throat> story. I, I kind of I didn't know what it was going to work out to be in my life service-wise, but I always knew that service was going to be important to me. You know, after the Army, I kind of took a look at corporate America for a minute, and I realized I just didn't, not that I didn't fit in or couldn't do a, a, a nice job and be successful and have a decent career, but there was always something missing at right. that time. So um, the Bureau kind of came calling, and uh, I fought it off for a bit of time, probably about a year and then I kind of gave in and said, let me go see what this is all about. And in the end, um, it turned out to be a wonderful career. I mean, just uh, everything that I was looking for, everything that I wanted it to be, um, had some of the same sense of camaraderie, um, some of the same sense as doing something bigger than yourself, which was always kind of the way I was raised. Sure. Uh, and what I did along the way kind of uh, followed that always. So... Bureau was great. Um, you kind of knew when it was time to, to take it to the ranch and to retire, sure. um, which for me was about, I can't believe it. It's been six years that I've been retired, but it was, I still have fond memories. I still have a ton of friends. Um, you know, I still have great stories and just fun, you know, kind of fun memories of good things going bad. I, I focused in a lot on a couple of things on, on white collar crime and frauds was important. Um, including healthcare and those things, a lot of public corruption, which mm -hmm. was rampant in the area that I was in, which was in the Northeast for most of my career, sure. um, short a couple times in DC and some time um, doing some stuff um, for the terrorism effort, right? Um, which we all did after 9-11. Well, you were pre-9-11 and post-9-11. Yeah, so. yeah. So I had an interesting kind of path. Uh, pre-9-11, we focused in on the things that traditionally you would imagine the Bureau does, right? you know, the, the organized crime. Uh, the bank robberies, the drugs, yeah, uh, the public corruption always. Um, the FBI used to be just like a, like big city cops, 
right? Yeah, that's a great way to put it. Um, I think it was just higher end with more resource investigation. So we had the resources. Right. And we had the reach, you know, kind of the reach across the country to kind of, um, you know, go whether it be to different field offices within the FBI or most importantly, good relationships and liaison with local police departments, state police departments, uh, counties. Um, most of my my really successful work was always partnered up with a great local police officer or right. a county police officer. Yeah. And, you know, it's funny. The story behind that is the FBI Academy, the National Academy, which yeah. sits in Quantico. It's about a 10-week program. That was one of the things that Hoover brought to light. And his reason for that, probably, I don't know this for sure, but I speculate, was to be able to kind of look at who was who amongst those different departments and right. what they were doing and why. Yeah. The guy was a freak about keeping information on everyone. Right. But it turned out to be this great benefit because as it became bigger, we kind of trained in the FBI methods and and allowed those police departments to kind of get past the myths. Right. Which were the FBI's a bunch of idiots. They're a bunch of assholes. They don't work with anyone. They're there just for themselves. Well, when those people come to our academy, our national academy, their yeah. future executive management managers or chiefs or even <laughs> higher ranking people internationally, and they realize, wow, you know, this is a really a great kind of program. Yeah. So I think that to me was a real powerful portion of my career right. is liaisoning with a lot of those folks and learning that their strengths were different than ours, but yet really, really complemented what we did and how we did it. Right. So what field office were you in a majority of your career? Majority of the career was in Newark, New Jersey. Uh, I spent some time in New York. I spent some time in Boston. Oh, really? I spent some time in D.C. Okay. Uh, but most of my career when I wasn't traveling yeah. uh, was right there in New Jersey. What and years were you in Boston? So Boston a little bit, I want to say pre-9-11 time okay. for a short period of time on special, what we would call uh, temporary duties. Sure. Or like special assignments. Okay. Leave it at that. Yeah. And, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, but New York, New Jersey was always, you know, I'm probably insulting some agents that spent their career in other offices. It's always where the best quote unquote work was. So sure. the cases that had the most traction, yeah. the cases that had the most attention, in my opinion, the cases that had the most impact, right? you know, across the bureau and across other federal agencies, across the different districts of uh, DOJ, Department of Justice, yeah. US attorney's offices, so if you're going to, like my dad would always say, if you're going to be a bear, be a grizzly. Oh, okay. You know, don't, maybe you don't want to start out in the Columbia, South Carolina office. It's a great place to finish up. Yeah. And kind of, uh, you know, your career kind of winds down. It's not a great place to start because there's not a lot going on that the senior agents don't have control of. Right. But in New Jersey, you get handed a case that's a huge case and they're like, go, young yeah. man. Yeah. Go, young lady. Right. And you're thinking to yourself, that case in Omaha, Nebraska will be worked by the entire field office. Right. I'm doing it by myself. Yeah. You know, so it's cool. Wow. It's a cool dynamic. So where were you during 9-11? Right in New Jersey. Uh, no way. Actually, it, it's an interesting story for me. So you could see like across the water. Well, not only see, I was on top of it. So uh. here's what happens. Just the way luck, nah, it won't be luck, but it was supposed to happen this way. Um, I had a meeting the morning of 9-11 at um, New Jersey State Police's Marine Barracks. So they have an actual uh, maritime patrol team. They're right. Very small, but elite. So they do a lot of uh, interdictions, you know, on the water, different things, that, and they focus a lot uh, on drugs. Right? Sure. That's a big part of it. So that morning we have this meeting. It was me and another agent, and uh, we're sitting down to figure out what if anything ever happened, a major catastrophe ever happened. What would we do? How would we set up offices or places that we could work out of right. if other places, field offices were destroyed or not able to get to? Yeah. And so we're sitting there having this meeting, and we all of a sudden, and you could see the towers pretty clearly. I mean, still about 10 miles as the crow flies away. Yeah. But you could see it. We're like, wow, there's smoke coming out of that tower. One of the younger troopers said, hey, you know, um, I'm not sure what that is, but my dad works in that building. I think he might have worked. I think North Tower was hit first, so Kenner Fitzgerald was there. Sure. Um, and there were a couple other offices, um, financial offices in there. As we know, Kenner Fitzgerald got wiped out, um, 600 and some somewhat deaths and terrible stuff. Yeah. Um, so I, we said, yeah, what do you want to do? He said, do you mind if we take this meeting on the water? Just get on the boat and go past. Yeah, because he wanted to go other. over to his, wanted to just yeah, check on his dad. Right. Hey, make sure everything's okay. Yeah. And if you remember, or if you might not remember, but 
um, everyone thought it was a small plane. That it just was reported as a Cessna, right? A Cessna that yeah. maybe the guy, the, there was a medical emergency and the pilot might have lost control, whatever. And that's what we were believing. So we start the truck across the water. We're still talking. I think, you know, this would, Battery Park would be a good place. The Coast Guard Station there would be a good place. We could do something back in Jersey, maybe out on Sandy Hook where we right. have access to the city, but we could see what's going on. And we're talking about this. And mm -hmm. so we get into New York Harbor and passing the Statue of Liberty and we hear this monstrous noise. Just the like second a second plane? And the, comes right over our head. And so any... You know, oh, so you saw the oh, second right plane over the head. The so tower. There's a lot of these folks that are saying like, ah, it never happened. It's yeah. a fraud. It's a government setup. Let me tell you, I heard and saw this thing. Right. And it kind of brought me back into my days in the Army. Yeah. The sounds and the smells and everything that went with this. We watched it go right into the South Tower. So uh, we looked at each other, and I can remember looking at one of the other troopers who is a good friend, uh, and we said, we're at war, man. This is war. This is wartime. Yeah. We're at war. And we both agreed to that. We're both like, wow, this is incredibly sad. And how many people must have just lost their lives on that impact? And now we knew that the North Tower was hit by another jetliner. So the did smell you, Did you have a feeling down. that they were going to go down? No. No, no. I, I never could have sensed that in a million years. I yeah. never could have sensed it because my thought was always it was constructed so well, engineered so well. What would it take to bring these down? Um, but, you know, those, those sons of bitches that did this, um, they just – probably the luckiest operation in the history of the world for them to hit the exact spots and dump all that jet fuel yeah. uh, all down those elevator shafts that just helped for that thing to burn as hot as it actually burned. Yeah. So now we get to the, we, we kind of get to the other side and there's chaos going on. There's people that are coming, trying to get out of there, the Staten Island Ferry. We had a smaller boat. People are actually trying to get on the boat to get out. Yeah. So we're trying to minister to them at the same time. We understand now we have a mission. Right, we have to kind of get forward and see whether or not we can help people, save mm -hmm. people. So the battery, uh, battery Park Coast Guard Station was right there. We headquartered there, ironically, which is one of the places we talked about headquartering. Should there be a major mass, you know, event, and here right. it was in front right. of us. Right. Right. So we make our way up to the towers, and uh, it is it is brutal, man. It's just you, you know, the things I saw and the things I watched and witnessed. No one should ever have to see your witness. And I had the experience and training in those areas. Yet mm -hmm. here I was, you know, basically going back to a spot that I never wanted to be in, in my head. Yeah. Um, so we get there and uh, we we wind up, you know, trying to rescue a few people. We had some Secret Service agents um, that were actually trapped. We helped them out. Secret Service had an office. I think it was in Building 7. Of the, which eventually wound up collapsing as well. So how did Building 7 go down? Because it wasn't hit. Yeah, I think it was just from the, the constant burn. Where was Building 7? Just, just if I remember, adjacent to the towers. Like so across the, the street or blocks away? I don't even know it was away. across the street. It, might have just, no, it definitely wasn't blocks away. It was pretty close. Okay. And so I think it might have gotten some of the, on the collapse, might have gotten damaged structurally, and that's what caused it to collapse as well. So if you remember, it was after the fact. And how many other buildings other than... I just think it was seven in the two towers. Uh, I don't think any other buildings went down. They were damaged significantly and were taken down yeah. later. But I think seven in, in the two towers were the three that actually collapsed based on this tragedy. So we get there and we're kind of trying to eye up and, and look at the risks, look at, you know, trying to prioritize what we need <clears throat> to do next, never imagining that these things would come down. Never. Yeah. Wasn't a thought. All I could think about is how are these firemen going to get up there? How are they going to make a how are they, How are they going to extinguish these flames? It was the smell and the heat coming off these things was, was ridiculous. Yeah. There was a Burger King that sat right across from the towers. There was a Burger King. I think there was a comic book store. Um, there was a couple other spots. And we wound up getting there just in time to kind of help some folks out, see what we could do. Uh, fire department rushing in, police department, you know, rushing in. So we're like, hey, we, we need to set up and establish some type of perimeter. We we felt maybe that 26 Fed, which was where FBI New York was headquartered, they didn't have the ability to get back to their office. So could we help them out and take on? We're, we're talking back and forth with our boss, right. especially agent in charge of New Jersey office, and he's given us guidance. And um, we kind of hear things kind of rumbling and changing. So we run down in the basement. Of you're the in the King. in the nope, not in the okay, towers. We're yeah, in the Burger King, right, right. And there was stairs going down, and one of the managers said, "We can get downstairs and kind of put ourselves in a position to survive if these things are pieces of these things are going to fall off." I survived the collapse in the basement of twenty of uh, the Burger King. 
Wow. And thought I was dead. Yeah. Thought I was dead. So I, I actually that, wrote it off. What did that I, I've sound never like? heard anything like it. I can't even recreate that. And I'm sorry, that. I, I know yeah. this must be... No, it's not. Know. It's not. I, I need to talk about this stuff, you know? And uh, I, I can't recreate it in my head. Yeah. Um, I just can't. I just know that I thought to myself, you know, they say there's a sense of doom yeah. when you know something bad's happened. The military talks about that a lot. Like before it happens? I, I experienced that that day. And only one other time in my life later when I had a cardiac incident and i thought to myself that's what saved me knowing the sense of doom that i had yeah. in the basement of the burger king on 9 11 was the same sense of doom i had sitting in my basement years later yeah experiencing what could have been a heart attack if i didn't react and go to the hospital immediately right my life was saved based on that sense of doom right it's so, crazy so you're so you're how far away from the from the trade Across towers the street it's across, it's literally across the street. And you're in the Burger King. In the basement, about six or seven stories down. Oh, so you're deep yeah, down. Yeah, okay, we're got deep, it. I which I never would have known. Yeah. Who would have known? But Manhattan Island, when the buildings went up, the, the depth that they went to to yeah. drive the pilings yeah. and to do what they had to do to structure these places was deep. And so there was another, there, there's a famous picture of a priest. It's a Catholic priest. I think it's Father Michael Judge was his name. And he's, they're carrying him out and he's, He's gone. He's passed. And his head's kind of to the side and his color's off. He was down in one of those, you know, down in the, either in the uh, ground floor of the <clears throat> Trade Center, um, but he got hit with a stone. Mm. And that's what killed him. Oh. And so I'm, we're down kind of in the same situation. The flurry of smoke and ash yeah. that came off of those things was. I mean, you see it on video. Yeah. You could see yeah, people running from it. Yeah, but that can't do it justice. It, it can't right? do it justice. It's blacked out. You don't see, you don't, you, you feel like you can't breathe. You feel, I mean, you know, we're covering our mouths. We had no, we had no equipment. We had just run from the boat. Yeah. Jumped in a car and drove up. Well, because you didn't know the severity no, of it. No, we never would have thought it would have collapsed. Yeah. But, you know, I survived that, wasn't able to, to you know, got out of there and we went over to um, Liberty State Park in Jersey City. And I think the most, you know, kind of the worst feeling I had was watching the setup. There was two separate setups. One was for survivors who needed medical treatment. Mm -hmm. The other one was for recovery for people who were trying to be ID'd. Right? Yeah. And I just remember there was no one going to the, the recovery zone, you know, yeah. to basically get treatment. No one. And I can remember thinking we, we were, I think it was a day and a half there. Not one person did they bring over for any type of treatment. Mm -hmm. And even like you saw, you know, the, the first responders who had absolutely a sense of just, it was, a, the feeling was incredibly sad, just a melancholy feeling the yeah. entire time. And I couldn't, we had no communications. So we had nothing was working. Was down, Towers right? were down, everything was down. So I'm trying to get word to my wife and to my children that I'm okay. They didn't know I was there, but I think they started to sense that maybe dad was over there because I knew you know, my my wife at the time knew I had a meeting where I had it, and she knew that yeah. was a possibility, and she knew me. She knew I was probably going to go yeah. if I could, yep. right? And so, um, as as God would a uh, God wink, yeah. Um, I see a fireman that I knew, and he survived it, thank God. And he had come from the Jersey side, I, I believe he was a Bayonne or a Jersey mm -hmm. City fireman. And I was like, hey, and we called him Blue. I can't remember even what his name was. He had blue eyes, and we called him Blue, and we would socialize with them. And I said, is there any way you can get a message to Sue that I'm okay? He said, I will. And he was able to radio to his wife okay. somehow, yeah. who was able to kind of pass a message to our mutual friend, yeah. who then got a message that Jim's okay. Wow. He's going to be a while, but he's okay. And then I spent the better part of three weeks um, you know, kind of either on the pile or uh, around the pile trying to recover. Man. And um, it was uh, intense. You know, you know the, the follow-up to that is I then... Years later, when I divorced my first wife, I married a 9-11 widow. So the irony of that yeah. and having and watching her um, suffering throughout my entire marriage years later, um, you know, kind of always brought back this intense feeling of being there. Right. And trying to help and knowing that the first time in my life there was no one to help. We had no one to help. No mm. one survived. Yeah. There's a couple survivors, but I don't even remember, you know, who they were. I don't know. It's just a, it's just a feeling of uh, probably the worst feeling of my career.
Yeah. You know, seeing all the things I saw in my life before that. Yeah. All the things I saw in my job after that. Yeah. That's one that will stick with me, you know, watching some of the things and listening and hearing and smelling some of the things that were part of that day and the weeks that followed that. And for anybody who's been through something traumatic where there's smell involved, you know, that is something that it sticks, you know? Yes. And yeah, I can't even imagine. I mean, there's so much. Uh, I mean, a city on its own has so many smells, but then that burn yeah. and there's once in a while I'll sense that. Um, and, and it, it might be real. Cause I'll ask the person I'm with, what, you know, you what does this that? smell like yeah. to you? And, you know, it just happened to me down at the Jersey shore. And, uh, you know, we kind of had that. And the person was like, it was actually my girlfriend. And she's like, yeah, it does. You know, it does smell like the, cause that stuff, remember that drifted. We're not far. Well, you could probably smell flies. that for miles and miles. Oh, miles. And just the, that very distinct, yeah. harsh, yeah. toxic smell. And we smelled it again on the on the Jersey Shore, which was a little, you know, we were like, what the hell's going Ghost on? Ghost smell. But yeah, definitely. So that stuck with me um, and kind of drove me <clears throat> in the next years of my career to always finish, you know, what we had started. And and you look back at the history of that investigation and things that had gone right and had gone wrong leading up to it. Yeah. And uh, it's just one of those things that um, it was the perfect storm. So it was by far the, the biggest intelligence failure, right? And a lot of people say that it was the FBI and the CIA didn't communicate effectively and all of that. Yeah. But but my question is, we saw what happened with 9-11. And let's say, let's leave the conspiracies aside because I know that there's a lot of them and to me, a lot of stuff doesn't add up with it, but yeah. it's not what we're talking about here. My question for you is now, when you look at the border being open and you see, you hear about a lot of just this terrorists, recent, these yeah, recent arrests, just just yeah. a few days ago, yes. and then and then you see up in La Jolla or somewhere, almost every day now they're they're taking these you know suicide boats and they're running them up, and then all these guys are getting off and running. I am so down for immigration. I am I am I I think this is the best country on earth. And I think that everybody that wants to be here should be able to be here. Yeah. But there's a process for it. And when you see these, I mean, you see everything going on with China, Taiwan, Russia, Ukraine, mm -hmm. Israel. And, you know, I mean, you, you see all of this stuff that's going on. It almost seems like we're so spread out, so th spread thin that we're leaving ourselves very vulnerable. So my my question to shorten it up is, do you think that we're vulnerable for another 9-11 style attack? You know, I, I won't go that far to say that type of attack because I will tell you that we've tightened up. Now, I've been gone six years, but I still have friends and colleagues that are still there. Um, I think we've done a tremendous job in, in avoiding or at least halting and getting in the way of some of the plots that have happened and were to happen mm -hmm. since then. Mm -hmm. uh, I think our intelligence work is so much better. I mean, obviously, technology has gone a long way to I that. Mean, yeah, that's yeah. I mean, yeah, that's got to be a big help. The better NSA. things. You know, I never, I'll, I'll be honest, I never experienced any of those um, CIA, FBI kind of conflicts. Okay. I, I never was at that level at the time. I saw some of that in my military days and, uh, you know, the, the <clears throat> lack of sharing, um, the ego versus soul uh, kind of conversations and thoughts about this is my operation, yeah. not yours, and the things that can really harm us in a lot of ways. Ego, when, you, when, you, when you're guided by ego as opposed to soul, yeah. bad things happen. Right. Right. So, um, but I will say that it has definitely gotten better. Um, relationships are one-to-one, -one, right? So it's not this agency versus that agency. It's right. who I know within the agency that I trust. Yeah, because it's and, people, right? People don't people. realize. And it's people and it's track record. Yeah. If you could trust somebody and they've gone, they haven't done you wrong the last time you dealt with them or the last five or ten times, that's the people you tend to to kind of migrate yeah. with and move forward and, and evolve to a different level of an investigative team. A lot of my work in the military ha was that, building teams. A lot of my work in the bureau was that, building teams mm -hmm. that go forward and, and have an open mind towards other people's thoughts, uh, analysis, opinions, intel, all the things that make cases what they are today yeah. and help resolve issues. So I think we're doing a hell of a lot of a Definitely doing a much, much, much better job. And I think if the American public knew about some of the things that we thwarted, that we thwarted along the way because yeah. of our ability 
with technology to listen, yep. to be around. You know, everybody thinks we're wiretapping everybody's phone, FISA and everybody's phone. That is not the case. That is yeah. a hard process. However, um, we're much better at gathering, analyzing, and utilizing Intel than yeah. we were in 1999, 2000. Yeah, right. Uh, even back in 93 when the first bombings happened that nobody really talks about, but people died there. You yeah. Know? And we didn't learn our lesson. There was a gap in time of, what, eight years before it happened again? And, um, you know, the, they play the long game. We don't. This country doesn't play the long game. Yeah. You know, it plays in cycles of four to eight years. Yeah. Right? Hey, we're going to get back, and then everything goes away, and we'll start restart on something else. BS. Right. You know, that's not the way to do it. Other, All these other people, good, bad, or indifferent, they play the long game. I don't feel... Like we're in trouble. I don't feel like we really? have issues to worry about on that scale. Yeah, but the well, fact how many that people died in nine eleven? I want to say uh, it's somewhere in mid mid three thousands, maybe thirty five hundred. Yeah, uh, and that might include it definitely includes the people on the aircraft, but it also includes maybe some of the Pentagon and even the um, yeah. the people that died in Pennsylvania. Yeah, and Shanksville, I think, is where they passed, if I remember. And but then eight thousand more people died. Soldiers died. Yeah, right. Combating that. Well, and all the you think of all the first responders that died of cancer. Absolutely, you know? still, still every single day. And my best buddy died in Afghanistan, two thousand ten, because yeah. he was fighting for this. You know, so that plane that went down in the field. Yeah. Do you think that that was shot down? I I go back and forth on that, and I, and I've I've commented on different podcasts about my thoughts. Sure. Um, me personally, yeah, I do. Yeah, me it personally, makes sense, I do. Right? You know, uh, for a lot of reasons. You know, there's a lot <clears> of things that, um, you know, I've kind of been able, I've had access to look at and hear, that make me think that might be the case. However, it doesn't take away from the heroic actions of those people on that. Yeah, side. yeah, absolutely. Be because they did, you know, they did things that I, I think about it every time I fly. Yeah, and the difference between, um, you know, people in my field that feel the way they do about national security and protecting others um, between those that are mostly go through their life asleep and as sheep. Yeah. They're kind of just moved around. They follow the flow. Um, all of my buddies that I've talked to that were in the bureau at the time, we've all said the same thing. And one of my buddies was supposed to be on the flight for, to San Fran, mm. which I think was, I want to say, um, I think that was 73. I think the one that went into the South tower believe and that took off from or not, Boston. 93 was it not flight 93 yeah 93 yes. yeah my uncle well, it was one of the ones that went took off from Newark but I can't remember got it okay I kind of blacked that out because um, the one that left from Boston my uncle yeah. worked uh at Logan Airport and he was I mean he was one of the guys right that, there. that watched that plane go out that yep. directed the planes Absolutely. out like that's crazy when you think of it had no idea you no know? idea and and if we did you know we would have done something differently yeah. obviously most of us but the buddy who was on that scheduled to be on that flight, and I forget the story, but it somehow got canceled. You know, somehow he, he he wasn't flying. To this day, if you talk to him, he'll tell you he wishes he was because sure. he knows he could have done something. Now, who knows? But I believe he would have tried. Yeah. And so I look at that flight that went down in the field in Pennsylvania, and I think those people, you know, weren't all sheep. Yeah. They jumped in. Yeah. And they did what they had to do. And every time I fly, I think about that. Yeah. Because you know we're we're bothered by a bad. You know, uh, we're oh, we're only at thirty four thousand feet, so we're getting a little bump. Yeah, no. Yeah, you know, I, I remember that, and I pray for those people every time I feel a little bump. I'm like, I can't imagine what you felt. Yeah, oh, I can't I imagine. Mean, and I they mean, knew they were going to die. Yeah, you know, they knew they were going to die. Um, yeah, and there was there were signs uh, leading up to that that we the bureau could have done a better job at analyzing and putting into action. The biggest one is is the pilots. You know, the the school in Arizona that was training and. Uh, they only wanted well, they to, didn't learn want to, to learn how to fly, land. land, land or take off. Yeah. They didn't need to know how to land or take off. They just wanted to know how to fly and how to steer. But were they learning Cessnas or were they? No, I think they were. I think they were learning big jets. Okay. I think they were on the simulators, if I remember. Yeah. But, but there was a 63-page memo written, what we call an electronic communication in the Bureau, an EC. And, yeah. Um, it was written about that. And we do kind of... Um, it's almost an assessment that we do. It's not an open case yet, but it sure. says there could be an issue. Oh, and here's yeah. what the issue might be, right? And it was handed to somebody in the New York office, and that person just buried it. Mm. Yeah, that person was like, ah, I don't think there's anything to it. Yeah. You know, a, a big boss, one of the big bosses. Mm. And um, so that that's a failure. That's the big failure, you know, is not not taking action on something that we know we should take action on. Yeah. And it goes back to a saying um, that I learned recently and I utilize all the time, but it's the magic lies in the work you're avoiding. Yeah, I heard that quote yesterday. Isn't that awesome? Yeah. Think about that. 
You know, we all avoid certain things. We all do. When we wake up in the morning, man, I don't want to do that email because I'm afraid I'll get pushed back, pushed back on it or it might not be exactly what the person needs or I don't, I'm intimidated by the person that I'm dealing with on this. But that's where the magic lies. Yeah. If you do that first, other things kind of move along. You know, um, so I, I think about in that case, somebody, somebody felt that there was uh, somebody avoided that. Well, imagine them afterwards. I do. And I think about the guy because I know him. Yeah. And um, I don't know if he's any worse for the wear, which is sad. But who knows? I'm not, I'm not with him every day. So. Well, the, like you said, like these organizations, these government entities are made up of people. And people are flawed. You know, just like we talked about in religion, right? People don't hate God. They hate religion. They yep. hate the corruption of what human beings do. So, so before we go into that, I want to talk a little bit more about your FBI career. Yeah. You did a lot of undercover work. Not a lot. I did, I did cameo roles, which led to improve my investigations. Okay. That's the best way to look at it. So when I think about um, how to advance investigations, and, and I had, I still do, I have a creative, more of a creative mind, more of an outside the box investigator. So if nice. that meant that I had to put myself in a different world, in a different situation, I had no problem doing that. And I would yeah. do it for others. Right. So I always wanted to be a helper, a helper yeah, you yeah. Know, to do so. Yeah, interesting, you know, interesting casework that always assisted me in being able to get that last piece of information that might be the puzzle piece that we needed. And in doing that, I would tell people that everybody I interviewed, hey, tell me something that I haven't asked because it might be the piece of the puzzle that I need, but you're thinking it's not important, but it's the last little piece that I need to kind of firm up this investigation. And you know where I learned that from? My dad. Oh, really? Because my dad... And here's the ironic part. My dad died well before I became an FBI agent. Right. A few years back, uh, I met a colleague of his who's now a practicing attorney in New Jersey who said, you know, Jimmy, I have a few tapes of your dad doing interrogations. You know, they're really, there's no use for them anymore. They've kind of gone past the statute. Yeah. But would you like them? Oh, that's I cool. said, sure. Yeah. You know, this is after he passed? This is way after he passed. Yeah. I mean, he passed in 95. This was maybe in 2016. Okay. And he delivered them to me. And I threw them in. I had to That's get a, I had cool. to go get a VCR to yeah. him because it was like yeah. I threw him in and, and the hair on the back of my neck was stood up because his interrogation style was Just my like interrogation yours. style. Yeah. And neither of us ever talked about interrogation See, style. And that's the DNA stuff, right? They talk about trauma being passed through DNA and and memories and all of this stuff, which makes sense, right? Like yeah. you, if you're a, a caveman and you give birth to somebody, you need to know where the berries are, right? That's right. You're absolutely right. There, yeah. there was no time for my dad and I, because he didn't know that's where I was going. Right. He didn't know I was going into the bureau. Yeah. Right? And um, I just remember like a tear in my eye watching that and saying, that's where I picked it up from. Yeah. You know, he was a very, my dad was, um, he was he was a mirroring minimization guy before it became popular in the interrogation world. You're saying like following like somebody's body yeah, language. Yeah, just, and just like never, I can remember, I asked him one time and it, it was a big case that he broke in, in Newark, New Jersey. It was a big arson ring of people lighting stuff up, trying to collect on insurance. And, oh, yeah. And before that was popular. Right. And I remember saying like, Dad, how do you do that? How do you get people to tell you things they don't want to tell you? And he'd say, just by never letting them say no. Yeah. Getting that one thing that they say yes to and then running it out. And that's how that, that stuck with me. So it does reflect in some of my interrogation and yeah. interview work. Right. But <clears throat> amazing that that could carry over a generation. Yeah. To be able to do that successfully. Um, you know, I, I often wish I could sit with him and and, and I could really have used my pop in a lot of ways. Yeah. But mostly, <clears throat> um, I, I often think about cases that he w probably would have closed a hell of a lot quicker <laughs> than I would have or did be just by his knowledge. You know, you know it's kind of cool because we always hate getting older and becoming our fathers, right? Like we, we all these things we swear we never would adopt. You know, my dad does this thing where he sits like this when he's driving. Like he'll drive and he'll he'll do, there's certain mannerisms. And I find myself doing that sometimes. I'm like, ah, it's annoying. You know, my brother and I call it check in the box. Like whenever we, you know, <laughs> he'll do something, I'll say, I'll oh, check the box. You're sounding like dad. And, but I realize it's cool because after, you know, he's, my father's still alive, but I know that after he passes away, having those mannerisms is cool because it, it makes me feel like I'm still connected to him. Like even when he's gone, like he's still there in those kind of senses, you know? 100%. And you will feel those things. I feel my father's presence very often. 
Yeah. And I think about it in what would he, I really truly think about what would he do here? Would this bother him? Right. And um, I never realized how, how much of a faithful man he was uh, until he passed. Yeah. I knew he was, but I always thought it was a check in the box, op, you know, obligation of the guilt ridden Catholic yeah. in the Northeast, as right. you and I have talked about before. Yeah. And it's kind of like, um, but then I realized it was, it was deeds. It was all things to glorify God. Yeah. And uh, he did it in his own way and he never talked about it. Yep. You know, humble, humble, humble servant. Yeah. Um, never talked about the things he did. And, you know, at my dad's wake, and again, he died at 66. I'm sitting, I'm going on 61. You know, it's like and my brother's 70. Yeah. So we talk about it. You know, wow, we, I, I congratulate my brother. I think he's the longest living male Diorio, you know, right. in our family line. Yeah. Um, and, you know, it's, a lot of it has to do with just the way the world is and modern medicine and taking care of yourself and those things. But I think about what people said to us at my dad's wake about things my dad had done. Yeah. And I, we had no idea. And he never talked about it. Never. He would just be, yeah, I got to go into work early, but then he'd do a deed yeah. for someone. And those people came to the wake and said, I want you to know this is what your dad did for my dad, or this is what your dad did for my brother, or this is what your dad did for me. Yeah. And we were blown away by that. I've tried to live my life more like my father with regards to doing for people just because. Yeah. Just because. And it does, it goes right back to glorifying our Lord. Right. You know, it, it, which is what it is. Yeah. You know. So. That's incredible. I mean, your father sounds like an amazing man. Amazing had man. A really, really good. Moody son of a gun. Yeah. <laughs> Don't get me wrong. He was a moody son of a gun. And I have some of that. Yeah. I've broken out of that in the last couple of years. Right. Yeah. But yeah. Yeah. I think uh, the right. The right people in your life help you to break out of that. And was your father in the military? My my dad uh, was was a public servant his okay. whole life. So um, tried to, yeah, uh, tried to enlist in World War II, but he was fourteen. Oh, geez. so uh, yeah, they took some other guys though from his group, yeah. <laughs> which was interesting. Yeah, um, but spent you know he's a World War II generation guy, so yep. um, always served in his way. Police officer, yeah. fireman. Uh, FBI and his National Academy, which you're talking about, he's actually yep. the first fireman to ever graduate from that wow. program. Wow. Okay. So, um, j just and then just amazing, amazing energy, um, and amazing thoughtfulness. Yeah. And I learned that by watching, and I try to live up to that every day. Yeah. Truly. I mean, the people that came from that World War II era were some of the best men that I've ever. I mean, you listen to these World War II. Oh. Uh, interviews and my grandfather was in World War II. He was in the Battle of the Bulge. He did. Wow. He was in a lot of wow. you know, and and yeah. a whole family. I mean, most men from that era went to war. Most, you know, most men. Yes. And when you hear some of their stories and the pride that they had for their country, when there was no the politics weren't, it wasn't left versus right and all nope. this bullshit. Where people were together. Yep. And much like that same feeling that everybody had on 9-11, where, right. where everybody was just. That's right. Let's go get those motherfuckers, yep. right? Yep. And you hear how these guys would die for their friends and how it's just like there's I, I wish that we had these kind of morals and ethics and old school values without some of the negative stuff from back in those times. But yes. hard times create good men. Good mm -hmm. men create easy times. Easy times create soft men like that kind of thing. That right? cyclical power of, of just generational thought and the way people take for granted the hard work that was perform before them yeah well you, you know? look at kids nowadays young kids they're and it's not their fault no but they they i mean they don't even play outside and when i look at like when my father was 18 he was cutting through the jungle in vietnam like that's it's that's just mind -blowing. To, yeah to me like i at 18 i was running around drinking beer smoking cigarettes with my friends like yeah. you know it's mind-blowing yeah it could be and you know, there's there's some <clears throat> sense of entitlement too that I see that this country. I think social media is a is a big part of that. Yeah. You know, hey, I that person has that at that age and they're influence or whatever the hell that means. Right. You know, it is what it is. But you look at that and they say, well, why don't I have it? Yeah. You know, and then it goes back to, um, you know, parents who who don't really encourage um, independent thought, yes. hard work, yeah, a work ethic. You have to do something. You don't have to do this, trophies. but you have to do something. Yeah. And they're handed, they're handed cash and they're handed money and they just forget about how to make it on their own. Yeah. You know? And and I think I think we're gonna I really have a feeling that's gonna cycle out not too long. It has to. It's gonna cycle out, you know, and people are gonna see that, hey, we need to improve 
what we have and how we have it in, yeah. in order to not get caught by the CCP. Yeah. Let's be honest, you know, so uh, my, my buddy and my business partner, Andy, Andy Bustamante talks about that all the time. Yeah. You know? So, um, but I think about that and I, I wake up in cold sweats once in a while, not often, <laughs> yeah. mostly, mostly, uh, from other, you know, other issues. Well, you know, Andy, I mean, Andy is a, a former CIA officer and he, the thing that scares me about Andy is Andy is like, it's not like, oh yeah, this might have, no, this is going to happen. Yeah. And this is my five or seven year plan, whatever he has yeah. to leave the country. Yeah. And, um, I don't know. I, I don't know about you, but I don't want to leave the country. I want to f- if yeah. if that shit happens, I want to fight. You yeah, know, like I don't yeah. want to leave. And he's all about national security and doing doing the things that are right for this country. Yeah, you know, and uh, that's a plan that he has. And you know, he's a brilliant man, but he's got a heart of gold. Yeah, and um, you know, just a brilliant guy. And uh, I'm I'm blessed. The story of he and I, I'm blessed to be in the situation I'm in right now. Yeah. Um, and it's again, it's it's a God wink, and uh, I talk about that a lot. You know, um. You and I talked a little bit about my story and where I'm at, what I'm doing, and, and yeah. why. Right. And the why is the big part and how it brings you peace. You know, I, I there's a quote that I love, and if it costs you your peace, it's too expensive. Yeah. And uh, that is the truth. Um, you know, clarity comes with peace. Sure. And with clarity comes the ability to make a difference and and to glorify, you know, really to glorify God. That's what, that's what my life has become, uh, Kevin, and we've talked about this before. All of the things I do, obviously, are to help people, yeah. right? To to prioritize their risks, to to make sure that I'm working for them, so that the things that are important to them and their peace of mind comes from me, yeah, comes from the things I can do and that God has given me to be able to do my tools, right? My set of tools, like Andrew has, Andy has a set of tools. The people that we work with have sets of tools, yeah, and we utilize that to help others and. Um, and it's pretty amazing, you know. And along the way, it's a business, so we build yeah. a business together. Yeah, yeah, which is cool because good businesses yeah. come from solving problems and helping people. So, Without a doubt. So, so tell me about Everyday Spy. I mean, you have your FBI background. You were an Army Ranger. Andy has his Air Force and CIA background. Yep. Who else is involved with Everyday Spy? So, so it's it's really evolving daily. Um, nice. I will tell you, and, I, and it's it's wonderful for me to be on the ground floor of it. Sure. Um, you know, I run my own business, J3 Global, which uh, <laughs> is, you know, it's really four simple things. It's asset protection, it's physical protection, it's cybersecurity. And when I say protection, I'm talking about securities on the physical side, on the on the asset side, what yeah. you have, what you, what you don't want to lose, the cyber side. But then mo- my bread and butter um, is investigations. And yeah. it's discrete investigations. It's right. leverage investigations. So are you a private investigator then? And I wouldn't say that. It's more like of a level of, of, of quarterbacking. Okay. Consulting. My clients, yeah, to make sure that they get everything they need in order to help them to focus on what they do best. Sure, right. Bustamante's side is to help them break barriers. So th- not not just to focus on what they do best, but to make what they do best better. Yeah, right. So he breaks barriers. That's what he does. Hey, we're going to use things that I learned in in CIA, and we're going to use things that the Oreo learned in FBI in order to improve your life. And your business. Right. And so we're we're now doing all kinds of different events around the country um, that are on Bustamante and EverydaySpy.com's website. Sure. Um, you know, I've, I've had been blessed and had the opportunity last summer when, when Bustamante calls you and says, hey, brother, you know, I think we can do some powerful things together. Yeah. That is not a party invitation. You should never RSVP no. Yeah, yeah, you're yeah. going and you're doing that. <laughs> and so together we have put together um, some really, really cool, impactful programs that provide value. Right. So one of my best buddies who, who is a big time CEO and um, and he runs the foundation that I'm involved in that I want to talk a little bit about, too. Um, but he uh, he says there's so many organizations that have the best intentions. Yeah. So I translate that there's so many companies do what Andy and I do that have yeah. the best intentions. But the difference is you have to get results. Mm-hmm. There's so many people that say, I can do this because for whatever reason, their own humanly flawed reason that I suffer from at the same time too. Well, right. man, I could make $5,000 you know, by helping, but they can't get results. So what winds up happening is we wind up picking up, because of our reputation, we pick that up and we run with it. And we sure. provide the results that the individual, the business, the high net worth person, 
uh, you know, the person that's going through terrible times. We provide them with a place where they fit in. Right. It goes to the, the song Fast Car that I love because Tracy Chapman just did it over with Luke Combs. Yeah. And there's a part in there where they kind of look at each other and they're talking about, you know, I remember riding in your car and, and you had your arm around my shoulder. And for the first time, I feel like I could be someone. Yes. I could fit in. That's the people that we're ministering to by doing the things we do. And right. it is a powerful experience. We got something we call Intel Edge. We got something we call OpDef Live. We put them together, and yeah. they're a powerful piece, and it's starting to pick up the pace. We're looking to do that for companies. We're looking right. to do that for big-time CEOs. We're looking to do that for high net worth who has family office. How do we do that? You know, Well, by the Bustamante method, which is never missing anything. Right, Dude is just straight down the middle. And I've worked for tons of organizations where there's no transparency. Yeah. Nobody tells you, hey, you know, you, you fucked that up. You know, you fucked that up. That He doesn't have any problem just saying, dude, bro, you fucked it up. Yeah. All right. Tell me how I can do it better. Yeah. And that's what yeah, I love Yeah, but nobody gets better, right? Nobody Unless better. you tell somebody. And, and people don't last. Right. They don't last when they're not given the ability to get better. Now, do you see that if you guys work with younger people, mm -hmm. do you see that they're kind of defiant to that type of leadership? Like they don't want to be told that they did something wrong? It, what I love about Bustamante is with his set of skills, yeah, which well, could pick you up yeah. you know, from a mile away, exactly who you are and what you're thinking about. Yeah. He doesn't attract those that are defiant. To yeah. He attracts the people that say, bring it on. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. And if they yeah. don't have that, they wash out in a day. Yeah, that's good. Bring it on. I want to hear about all the crap I've done terribly wrong. Yeah. Right? And we could when we could chuckle about it, we could laugh about it. Um, you know, he brought in a president, uh, a guy named Rusty Bridges, yeah. who is friggin' lights out. Uh, I've never worked with somebody that's as impactful and as experienced in taking businesses from zero to a million in two seconds. Right. So I'm just happy with the way it lies out. Plus, it allows me the independency to be able to run my own business at right. the same time yeah. and learn. Take that all in. Hey, this is great. You know, so it's been an eye opener for me. I've lo I love what I did before that with my five years at J3. I mean, it was great. I, yeah. I made, you know, good friends, did some good work, uh, made some people safer was impactful to their businesses and their personal lives. But this, I think we could take on a different level. Is this more fulfilling? Yes. Yeah. And a million percent. You, you know, one thing I really like about your story is you've been through a lot, right? I mean, you, you were an army ranger, mm -hmm. West Point grad, FBI agent, nine, I mean, I didn't even know about the nine yeah. 11. I had a feeling just cause you're yeah. a, a East you're like, coast guy. Yeah. And here's the thing about law enforcement, right? People that are in law enforcement typically pass away not that long after they retire because, I mean, not just law enforcement, that's anything, right? Yes. Because they lose that purpose. But yes, now it purpose. seems like you're more purposeful and, and more filled than ever. Than ever. And, um, you know, that has a lot to do with having to. Yeah. You know, sometimes we're just forced to do things because we have to, but it also has to do with, you know, my finding in my faith. Yes. And so how that transitioned me. Um, you know, short story about that. Uh, yeah. Fall of, of 2022, one of my best friends from West Point whose wife had suffered from, you know, uh, breast cancer and bone cancer for six years had gone through hell, um, went into hospice. And the woman I was <clears throat> married to at the time said to me, Jim, you know you have to go to that wake, right? And I was like, I'm sitting in New Jersey, and this was going to happen in Lincoln, Nebraska. And in my mind, I was like, no, I'm not going to do it. You know, no way. I can't make it out there. I mean, the hospice, we all know, except for, for some reason, Jimmy Carter's lasted the longest in the history of hospice. But yeah. I knew what hospice meant, right? It meant you don't have a hell of a lot of time. So yes. in my mind, I couldn't put it together. Well, she passed, she passed away just a day or two after that. And um, one of my buddies, another one of my best buddies, Stan Olson, who's really responsible for my transformation um, as is God, but he's the guy who brought it to me. Um, he said, hey, uh, when's the wake? When's the ceremony? When's the, when's the celebration of life? And I said, well, I, I'll let you know when I find out. And I did. This was on a Tuesday. It was the following Friday in Lincoln, Nebraska. Right. And I had a bunch of things planned to do, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. And um, he said, are you going? I said, I don't think so. And he said, all right, well, send me the info. And the next day he called me and said, in no uncertain terms, your ass better be in Chicago uh, by no later than Wednesday night, you know, because we're going to this thing. Yeah. You make it to Chicago and I'll drive to Lincoln. 
And I'm thinking to myself, man, uh, okay, I'm trying to put the time frame together. But next thing and I know, I'm in, in my Jersey? car. Yeah, I'm in Jersey. Yeah. I'm in my Jeep. Yeah. And I'm driving west. And made it to Chicago. I have no idea why. I honestly don't have an idea why. And I'm in Chicago, and we we wind up playing golf the next day, which I know my buddy Eric Whipple, who lost his wife, uh, Lori, is going to be listening to this. He's really pissed off that we played golf on that Thursday without him. Yeah. So, uh, But these are my best buddies in the world. My other buddy, Shane Downey, who's who's a, a big part of our of what's been happening with right. the two. Um, and anyway, Thursday he said, okay, uh, we're leaving tomorrow morning. You know, We're leaving at 4 a.m. tomorrow morning. We're driving to Lincoln. I said, how far is Lincoln? He said, eight more hours. So we jump in the car, you know, after coffee and the things that we do and talking, doing jokes and all the things we do, you know, staying and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. He says, um, he starts talking to me, not at me, just, you know, about me. Hey, I, I you know, I found this new church and it's kind of going. And yeah, if you watch that show, The Chosen, and have you, uh, you know, let me talk to you about it. And I said, what, what, are you talk, what are you talking about? You know, well, why are we talking about this? And I don't believe there's anything after, you know, there's no, there's no after. I mean, this is it. We get this, it's over, it's miserable. You know, you go through it, you whatever, and that's it. You die and you go into the dirt and you regenerate it in some other plant form, you know, and he's like, really? And so patience, you know, Stan's patient guy. Yeah. And for the next seven hours, you know, he just, in his own way, not in a forceful way, but he came at me challenging my beliefs, challenging why maybe that's not the thing. And, and, and this is while you're on a drive. While right? on a drive. Yeah. And I'm getting more and more pissed off because, you know, I'm an Italian Jersey guy, so yeah. it's pissing me off. I don't want to talk about this. We're just going to this wake because it's something I have to do, yeah. you know, and I really don't want to be doing it because my ex-wife told me to do it, so there's another aspect to it. Yeah. I don't want to talk about it, you know, whatever. So he's patient. He says, well, I'm not willing. I said, well, what's your, what's your fucking story? What do you believe in? And he's like, well, I'm just not willing to roll the dice. I live my life according to that, you know, according to three things. And he's like fellowship, scripture, and prayer. Mm. I'm like, well, that sounds like a great way to go. I live my by, you know, golf, uh, you know, <laughs> blowing off, blowing off these kinds of stupid trips, and yeah. uh, you know, whatever. So he's like, oh, great, you know. So we pull into the, par the parking lot of our hotel, and I'm beside myself, and I'm like, dude, I don't want to talk about it anymore. Just shut the fuck up. That's exactly what I tell him. So he's like, oh, okay. So we go, we check into our room. We had we shared rooms. Right? Yeah. We shared a room. Yeah, yeah. So we get dressed into our suit and whatever. I'm like, don't talk to me about it anymore. And I'm thinking to myself, I'm going to just fly back, man. I'm going to fly back to Chicago and take my car and drive home. I'm not even going to go to this. Yeah. You know, but and I'm like, hey, all right, I got to go. So we pull into where it's going to happen at this church, small church, small Bible church in, in Nebraska, in Lincoln, Nebraska. Yeah. Pull in, walk up, and I'm um, looking around like, you know, I'm just seething, seething with, I can't believe this guy, knowing that I'm going through, you know, a divorce, knowing that's going to happen. This is what he thinks about talking to me, you know? And as we walk in, I said like, yeah, you know what? I'm doing just fine. He says, yeah, it sounds like everything's going great for you. That's what he said. And he walked in and I, I was like, hmm, you know, beside myself. I wanted to kill him. Because you knew in. it was true? Well, I probably, but at the time I was like, shut, you know, you don't know what you're talking about kind of, sure. thing, you know? We walk into this thing. It's a it's a it's a beautiful vestibule. The church. It's open. There's about 150 people waiting. One of the girls there says, "Hey, sign in. Sign your name here. It'll open. We'll open the doors at 5 p.m. You know, blah blah blah. Whatever. Okay. I'm just standing there. I'm looking. There's a curtain across. A shear, shears across this door that obviously is where the body's laid out, where Lori's laid out. And uh, the door opens. And my buddy Eric scan. He scans the whole area, and he puts his eyes on me, and he just walks through everybody. People are, hey, hey, what's everybody? He wraps his arms around me and he says, looks, leans back and says, I knew you would be here. And I thought to myself, there might be something to this. Because mm. he had no idea I was coming, you know, and he said, thank you. And you didn't either, but you. Something and, drove me to go there. Well, and when you were leaving, you kind of, when we were talking earlier before yeah. we started, you had yeah. mentioned that you didn't even feel like it, like it was almost like you were viewing yourself going there right? totally like you drawn totally yeah. drawn to this for some reason when eric said that i felt something i felt like a rush and i was like you know and the night kind of went better like like being there talking to people seeing the people that showed up for him and for her mm -hmm. looking at her remembering her at the kind beautiful soul that she was always love just love they had one daughter Right, their daughter was there, Emily, and I remember her from when she was a baby. You know, we had so many great times together and talking. I remember their, them at my daughter's wedding and yeah. how much fun. And they always were a couple that was in love. She was sick at the time. She still was there. Yeah. Right. And uh, start talking. We go out with a bunch of guys that had showed up from my West Point class and my company. 
Um, and we're just talking and laughing and have a good time. And Eric's t talking about her last days. And, and he's like, yeah, you know, I said, did you, are you going to talk tomorrow? He says, I don't think, I don't think so. I don't think I'm going to be able to do it. So my brother Jason's going to read it, but I wrote it. He says, I wrote it years ago. You know, I started it years ago when she was really suffering with walking and things that she couldn't do. And I just jotted down some notes about how we met and how our lives progressed together and how much better she made my life. And I'm like, wow. Well, the next day we go to the celebration of life. And who do you think gets up to eulogize her? Eric. And he talks, and I could break down thinking about this, but he talks for 45 minutes, and I've never heard anything like it. And my friend Stan leans in, and he says, that's what I want for you, that piece. And I was like, Phew. The last thing that Eric put up was portions of Lori's prayer journal. She wrote every day. She prayed for people every day, for different people, for different things. And I'm, I know I was on that list. I found that out later. Yeah. And um, one of the things that stuck with me is probably in the last hours of her consciousness, before she slipped into a coma, before she passed, she had written something that just clearly and basically said, thank you, Lord, for always showing up. <laughs> and I thought to myself, what? You know? Who am I? Who am I to not embrace that and run with that? And since that day in November of 2022, my life has been different. It's been better beyond anything I've ever had. It's been at peace, and it's a time when I needed it because my life was in turmoil. Mm. There was questions and things that happened. I separated myself. I isolated myself after that in my own place for the first time ever. First time I ever lived alone for an extended period of time. But God was there. Yeah. And we fought that fight together. And he stick, stuck with me like he was there the whole time. One of my buddies has said, God is ever faithful. He was always there. Yeah. You just didn't see him. Right. You didn't feel him. Well, I do now. And it has changed my life. It is yeah. I, Everything I do is to glorify God. What we're doing here today, and we talked about this together, if we can help somebody out there that's listening to this and saying, that's what I need. Yeah. Give me some of that. How do I get that? Well, damn, hit me up. You know, hit me up. Anything I can do, I'm for your audience or you or yeah. or Leo here, anybody, I'm willing to do that. And and, it, and Jim's powerful. info is going to be in the description, uh, your Instagram, your whatever contact info. Yep. Um, so that's really good. And one thing to really like, I know we sort of talked about it earlier, but people want a relationship with God, right? Mm -hmm. I think that they either don't believe that there is a God or they, which deep down, I don't know if anybody really believes that, but... Um, you know, it's it's the it's the human corruption of religion, right? It's the priests that are sexually molesting children. It's the money that's being taken. It's the lies. It's the all the stuff that humans do across the world mm -hmm. that kind of takes away from the purity of God, yeah. right? And and whatever that is. And when I got sober, I had a bunch of experiences that made me go from an atheist to like, okay, probably an agnostic, to holy shit, there's something here, to a firm believer in in something, right? And and I'm still kind of on that seeking path, and I'm still, once you feel that, mm -hmm. and you realize, and you maybe have some certain experiences that you may not even be able to explain to anybody, because I know that what you're feeling, what you're mentioning, you can't put into words. No. You just can't, right? No, it's a feeling. It's a rush. Mm. It's a rush of the Holy Spirit. Yeah. You know, and, and I... I so respect the fact that you can talk about what you're talking about right now because it's powerful and it's helping people. Yeah. You know, it's a, your transition that's still in process. We all are. We're still in, but God only looks for the flawed. Yeah. Because that's those are the people he can he can help with his with the platform he needs for them to be on. Right. And you have that here. You've offered that to me. And for that I'll ever grateful. Yeah. You know, and you've offered that ability for me to do that. You know, I think about um just recently I was on a horrific flight coming just going into dallas yeah and it was like we had a park outside we basically were in the air parked outside yeah. of little rock arkansas and yeah. it was just and the pilot came on they never do this he said listen folks i want to apologize because there is no smooth air nothing i've tried every single altitude we can't get into dallas fort worth fort worth for another 45 minutes and you know people were upset they were they were scared yeah and i'm sitting there just with a smile on my face yeah i felt like i was like I'm good because I got the Holy Spirit just flying me all over the place. Yeah, he's taking a he's taking a rough ride, but I'm good to go. That's the sense of what I feel. That's the sense of peace 
and peace leads to clarity. Man. Yeah. And that's why we're at the point now. I I feel like I have God's favor, and so many of you out in the audience do have God's favor. Right. So so glorify Him by utilizing that through your set of skills, what you do best. I don't do this. I think I was doing a lot of this for ego, right? Even podcasts in the past. Let me tell a story about when I did. Yeah, it's really cool stuff, but it has nothing to do with why I'm supposed to be doing it. Yeah. And how I'm supposed to be doing it. And to me, that is a portion that's incredibly valuable to everyone. Yeah. Right? Knowing that we all have God's favor in our own way and we need to capitalize on that for his glory. Right. That's amazing. Yeah. You, you, you're amazing, man, what you do. I really appreciate, you know, everything that you're doing and how you do it because there's not a lot of people that want to do this for the right reason. Yeah. And I love that. Well, I know? think it started in ego, right? Like, Always. Like a lot of people start podcasts because they want to be the next Joe Rogan or something. And then through storytelling, and and honestly, it's a selfish thing that I do, right? Like it's it's I get to learn from people like you. I We never would have sat down outside of this maybe in an interrogation or something, but, <laughs> you know, but, but really like, you. yeah, but, but no, but, but really like we, we probably never would have had this conversation if it weren't for the podcast. So it's funny cause it started with one intention and it's, it's just crazy what it's turning into and what I know it'll be in the future and why it'll be that. So a hundred percent and the way you're doing it, I love it. You know, it's, it's a, it's a great approach and, um, you know, I know I've talked to Julian and Danny and, and, you know, I know Andy's going to come in here <clears throat> and, uh, I just think that we feel like you are, you are a guy that is in it for the reasons that we're in things, you know, yeah. we're, we're looking at it. Yeah. It does. Everything starts in ego and kind of breaks off into soul. Right. When you realize, you realize the things that bother you, um, you know, we were just having a conversation with my girlfriend last night, the things that bother you that you see are purely projections of, of you, or your speculation, you sure. know, like, Oh, I don't know why that's happening. Well, why does it bother me? Mm. You know, and I will give credit to my ex-wife, yeah. who, who kind of the, the most recent one, the 9-11 widow. She she was a big follower of that. You know, right. like if you see something in somebody, she used to say, if you spot it, you got it. Right? Yeah. And it's yeah. true. And if you could back yourself off and say, Wow, that's why it's bothering me. It's me. Yeah. It's not them. It's yeah. me. You yeah. know, and um I like what you're doing here. I really, I really in, have enjoyed, you know even our time to, before we, we started recording. Sure. Which Leo said we should, should have started recording before. Yeah, we should have. That's but, Usually there's a podcast before the podcast, <laughs> you know. But, but yeah, I mean, for me, it's just um, continuing the, to, to strive to, to help people um, because that's what we're supposed to be doing. Yeah. Is helping others in the best way that we can until we can't anymore. Yeah. Which is really, you know, hopefully for me, it's a, it's a long time away. I mean, at 60, I feel like I still have... I have a 12 year plan. Yeah, 60. you're just getting started. It's pretty good. It's, man. it's I'm mean, restarting. Yeah. I'm re I'm totally resiliency is a powerful tool. Yeah. You know, to be able to say, yeah, let's go. You know, yeah, yeah, I got I got beat up. I got knocked down. So what? Yeah. So what? You know, let's move it forward. Let's just get where we need to be as quickly as we can so we can help others. Yeah. Well, Jim, um, we're gonna have to do a part two. We At any time. I'll yeah. come back here in two seconds. Yeah. Plus, yeah. I love it here. San Diego's beautiful. Yeah, it's a good excuse to come out here and, and get out of LA to the better. I, oh. Do you like LA? Uh, I used to. Yeah. <laughs> LA is LA is pretty beat up, man. Oh, now it's. I mean, Whoa. since COVID I, I and mean, even a little holy, before that. Holy cow! It yeah. is a little. It's a little scary. Yeah. It's a little scary, you yeah. know. And I, I stay. You know, I stay in like the Beverly Hills area because one of my clients is. But there. even Beverly Hills, but, but it's is, getting. Like, yeah, I'm in a hotel. I'm in a beautiful hotel, staying there, and there was a smash and grab. Yeah, in the hotel. Oh yeah. I mean, I'm talking. These they have full time security. Somebody broke the glass, and the guy's jewelry, yeah. jewelry store was completely wiped out. Yeah, because they know they're not going to get prosecuted. Exactly. And or, or if they get arrested, or, or it's probably an inside job. I hate to say yeah. that. I'm sorry if yeah, I yeah, commented yeah. on that at Beverly Hills PD. I said I wouldn't, <laughs> but I'm going to say you guys should look inside. Yeah. Um, if you need help, the Oreo's uh, the Oreo's available. So, <laughs> and that's the investigator there. Well, we're gonna do another one, guys. Um, please go check out uh, all of his links that are in the bio. And if you could leave the audience with one last positive message, yeah, I think it. I think what it is is be a giver. There's times in your life when you have to take, but be a giver and don't expect anything in return. That's kind of the way I've learned. I was totally opposite of that. I was a taker, and. Um, not all the time, but most of the time. Be a giver um, and don't expect anything in return. Mm -hmm. And and watch watch what happens. Yeah. Um, Religious-wise, 
three things I challenge you to do. Fellowship, and that is helping. Um, get into the Scripture, even if you've never done that before. I never did. I just had the missalette from the Catholic Church. So that's, I thought the Bible was only you know a little bit, like like half an inch thick. Right. Um, and then secondly, prayer. And learn how to pray. And pray. Praying is nothing more than talking to your Father. You know, mm. hey, this is what I'm thinking, and I'm hoping to where I'm at. I, I challenge you to do that and reach out if there's anything ever that I can help you with. Amazing. And I just want to add something just because you said that. Uh, when I first got sober, there was a, a guy in – I got sober in Dorchester, neighborhood in Boston, very, sure. yeah. very – and the, the Alcoholics Anonymous community there is full of old-school – tough Boston guys that got sober. You know, they were all bad dudes in the past, and then they got so. And a lot of them, cops, I mean, a lot of everything. I mean, the mayor at the time was there, you know. And uh, But this this old guy took me under his wing, and he really helped me when I was at my lowest. And I remember he told me to pray, you know. And I, at this time, was just having experiences where I was starting to sort of believe that there was something else. But he taught me how to pray, and I thought he would always tell me, he's a you know, old-school, tough guy from Boston, you better fucking get on your knees and fucking pray, you know, like that, right? You know, but, he, but he's like, you need to do this every night. He's like, I don't care what you do. You start and end every day on your knees praying, and Love I it. thought it was corny. And every time I talked to him on the phone, it was like, you know, even after he moved out to California, it's like, hey, are you? And he knows, exa- without talking, he knows exactly what I'm doing and what I'm not. Like, he'll say, hey, stop fighting with your girlfriend. Stop doing this. Stop doing that. And he'll just know. But he always starts it out with, hey, are you praying? Love it. And it's weird because when, you know, I, I, for him, out of the respect for him, because I told him I would do it, I did it. And it wasn't for me. It was for because I told him I would do it. And every time I was like, all right, I'm doing this for the guy's name's Danny. I'm doing this for Danny. All right, you know, and and it was weird because it was for me the whole time, and that was a gift that he gave me. Because even before I believed in God, really, it the, you know, uh, yeah, prayer is a weird thing when you realize that it, uh, it works. You Powerful. know, yeah, that's awesome. So I yeah. love that. Thank you for adding that, Jim. Thank you for coming on. Yeah, my pleasure. It. I'll yeah. be back. Yeah, absolutely. Definitely, thank you. Man.